Hello, everybody. I am Drew Duncan. Welcome to LST Late Night Sports Talk. All right, let's get right into it. No BS, no screwing around. Uh, obviously, we want to get started with USC 279. Look, I respect Nate Diaz as a fighter. I respect what he's done in the MMA world. I respect what he's done, period. Okay, he's made a name for himself. Um, despite having a career that in terms of wins and losses hasn't really been necessarily the best. But to a lot of people, he is a legend. And the bottom line is, he is a Gracie black belt. Now, you don't get there just to get there. I've interviewed Hoist Gracie. He's talked to me about what it takes to be a black belt, not drinking, not smoking, doing a lot of other different things um, in order to be a black belt under Hoist Gracie, period. So if you're going to be a Gracie black belt, you better be a bad dude. And you're going to be a bad dude. And he proved it by winning with the guillotine. But of course, in typical Nate Diaz fashion, he just wasn't able to go without mentioning Conor McGregor somehow, some way, right? Him and McGregor have been beefing for the longest time. And to be honest with you, I'm not really sure that I'm just kind of over it. Yeah, sure. If they had a trilogy the way that McGregor promised that they're going to have in a tweet that he put out a couple of days ago, then yeah, absolutely. Sure. Why not? You know, watch a fight. Okay. And it'd be another hell of a fight. Right. So I don't think we would be disappointed in it. You could say what you want to about Conor McGregor, and that's fine. You could talk about how many wins and losses he himself has had um, in the latter part of his career. Uh, but Nate Diaz was talking about going and fighting in, in other mediums, right? He was talking about, you know, just doing whatever, kickboxing, jujitsu matches, um, boxing. And, of course, you know, he started out by saying other oh, guys have tried to do it and they couldn't do it. McGregor couldn't do it. And it's just like... Bro, you could have taken a shot at anybody. You could have taken a shot at Tyron Woodley. You could have taken a shot at a lot of other guys. But you just couldn't help yourself when it came to Conor McGregor, could you? You just couldn't. It just, you know, it was just there for the taking, that low-hanging fruit that we all know that Nate Diaz relies on to keep himself relevant in the Twitter, Twitter world. Basically, that's really what it amounts to. I'm going to show these guys how it's done, blah, blah, blah. Dude, you've been talking about going and doing boxing for years now. And I have yet to see Nate Diaz step into a boxing ring. If he ever sees this, he'll probably throw shade at me too. But the reality of it is it was a, a fun fight. As far as the fight goes, it was a fun fight to watch. It really was. And, and you know, those guys were John with each other, him and Tony Ferguson. They were John with each other, smiling at each other, giving each other a lot of daps. Um, you know, Diaz was being a showman, right? He was being a showman. He was, you know, kind of hanging out on the cage, right? Giving the crowd a little something, double daring Tony Ferguson to come in on him, right? I'm daring you, bro. You know I'm here. What are you going to do about it? At one point, he shook his head, and I, I still don't quite understand why. I thought maybe he was giving up. Um, Tony Ferguson got in some really good leg kicks, but he didn't really capitalize on him in the way that I thought that he could have. So be that as it may, you know, in the third and obviously into the fourth round, um, Diaz ended up putting on a clinic. I don't think there's anybody better in MMA at setting people up and wearing them down and, you know, doing whatever it takes strategy wise to kind of get in somebody's head, make them relax a little bit to the point where they're relaxing a little too much and, and give Ferguson credit. You know, because he fought through uh, two messed up eyes, his shin was cut, bleeding all over the place. I mean, Ferguson looked like he had been through a mauling. It looked like a tiger got a hold of him. And to his credit, he was able to do, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going. But eventually got him in that guillotine. Ferguson, I was really surprised, went for a takedown against Nate Diaz. As I said, he is a Gracie black belt. That does perpetrate the idea that you are, in fact, a bit of a badass, my man. Uh, in, in terms of what Nate Diaz said about, you know, Conor McGregor and all that, I'm over it. Make the third fight happen or don't. Whatever it's got to take. I know that this is his last contracted fight right now with the UFC. He says he's going to step away for a little while. We'll we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll end up re meeting in a boxing ring instead. But be that as it may, overall, I don't think 279 really could have gone any better. 
Uh, you had a rabid crowd. Dana White's got to be walking away pretty happy from this. If I'm Dana White, I'm actually really excited because it was a disaster. You had whatever the hell happened backstage, right? They they showed little clips of it and all that stuff with, you know, Holland and Shemayev. Um Diaz, when I saw him walking, he looked like he was walking a little, little gingerly, okay? And he also appeared to have a little something on his cheek, right? So whatever the hell happened back there could have spilled real disaster. Then, of course, you had Shemayev not even make weight for the main event. So then they had to shuffle things around. Guys were taking fights at really short notice. This thing could have ended really badly for Dana White. But really, in the end, it ended up being a pretty good fight card. Very entertaining for the most part, top to bottom. Um, as far as the Chimea fight goes with Holland, look, he went in quick, okay? He saw, an, he saw an opening, and I mean, he just slithered like a snake in there quick. Venom just viper and just took a hold of the situation. And Holland was doing everything he could to fight Shemayev off, and he just could not do it. He was too quick. He was too fast. He was too good at rolling. He was too good at everything. He had him exactly where he wanted him, and it was risk-reward. Because obviously, you're expending a lot of energy at that point, especially with having a difficult time cutting weight. Like he says that his doctor told him he was doing, hey, man. Man, uh, you're gonna have to start hydrating. You got to drink water. Um, knowing that he had gone through that exhaustive process, it was risk reward. He knew that he had to end that fight quick. It wasn't gonna be one of those situations where I think he felt like if he was gonna keep going, then he knew that the longer the fight went, the less it would be in his advantage in favor of Holland. And for all that build up, you know, Holland called him a fake gangster. She may have saying everybody in my country is a gangster. You know, the crowd booing at every given moment. I mean, Shemayev really just, he didn't give a damn. I mean, he said, I'm coming for everybody. He called himself a killer. I mean, I, you know, and he's like, I'm going to kill everybody. I don't care. The sport is mine. I don't care what weight it is. It's all mine. It's mine. It's, I mean, he was going off. And he was loving every minute of the backlash. He really didn't give a damn. You know, and at one point, that crowd really reminded me of an Attitude Era crowd, right? With Steve Austin and, and The Rock back in the day, the the chanting and, you know, just the intensity, the atmosphere, the excitement that those fans really brought really helped make that fight card what it was. It was really the fanship and the fanfare and the way that the fighters gravitated off of that and the way that they responded to the fans, smiling, you know, giving the fans a show in their own way, guys dancing, coming out to the octagon, doing all that stuff. It really made the night pretty exciting. A lot of what happened at USC 279 is going to be accredited to the fans. At least I think it should be, absolutely. In terms of what we saw from Chimeyev, look, man, he claims again that his doctor told him you got to hydrate, you, you can't keep cutting like this, which tells me that he was trying to do like a really dramatic cut, probably 20 pounds or so, maybe even more inside of a couple of weeks. And, you know, people forget your brain, that thing is a muscle too. And if that gets dehydrated, your organs start dehydrating, it's going to be a real problem. You want to talk about crashing and shutting down, that is potentially what could happen in the worst possible way. So when all is said and done, if he can't get down to 170, he's either going to have to manage his walk on a, you know, walk on a weight round better, or he is going to have to move up to probably 185. He really didn't answer Joe Rogan very directly when he asked him, dude, are you going to fight at 170? Are you going to have to fight at 185 now? What's the scenario with that? You know, I really think that he didn't, want to really answer that question he tiptoed around it pretty good um which was surprising because he was so blunt and everything else he had to say but uh, regardless that's pretty much your 279 uh really good fight also uh Deanna, she had a really good fight too uh she finished a fight with the man that liver shot boy that that looked dangerous if i'm being really honest with you that liver shot absolutely looked dangerous and it could shut down the whole body um, so pretty dangerous fights tonight, really exciting fights tonight, overall, really good atmosphere. Again, the crowd is going to be accredited to what happened at 279. If you ask me, and if you're Dana White, it just absolutely could not have gone any better for you. You want to talk about a slick recovery, 
um, taking a risk after one Conor McGregor, of all people, said, hey, uh, this shouldn't have happened. If guys can't make weight, you don't need to be shifting stuff around. Dana took the ultimate risk and instead of just trying to replace fights, said, nah, here's what we're going to do and ended up working out in his favor. I'm going to tell you what, uh, calculated genius or amazingly lucky, I'll let you decide on that one. A uh, little bit of college football today. Boy, did today prove again what I continuously talk about in college football or what? I mean, seriously, you had Notre Dame fairly competitive against Ohio State last weekend, right? Uh, this weekend just looked horrendous at home against Marshall. Again, preseason rankings. We're in basically week three. They're going to call it week two, but there was college football on the weekend before that with Nebraska, et cetera. Um, there was nothing to be desired about Notre Dame in that game. Rank number eight, even after the loss to Ohio State, and could not get it done against Marshall. Too many you know, turnovers, just couldn't get really the run game going. Offensively, they were just porous all the way through. Defensively, they weren't bad, but you know they, they were already in bad situations to begin with on most drives, and it really favored Marshall, who just played the waiting game, and it ended up working in their favor. I mean, that's really what it amounted to. It's not that Marshall did anything special. It's just that they made some really play or really big plays defensively that ended up winning that football game for them. That's really what it boiled down to. And again, did Notre Dame deserve to be ranked number eight? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves every single season. And I don't want to hear this about, well, you never really know. Uh, exactly. We never really know. So why are we giving them the benefit of the doubt early on in the year? Okay, we're uh, the Skip Baylesses of the world, I guess, are just anointing people to the college football playoff that don't deserve to be there yet. Okay, you have to earn your way to the college football playoff. Last I checked, you have to earn a ranking. Sure, Alabama comes in ranked highly every single season, but at least they've been able to back it up every year with Nick Saban. I mean, it's been really one of the few exceptions over the last 20 years or so. When you really think about it, teams are starting in the top 10. How many are finishing in the top 10? Right, You had Florida last week beat a seventh-ranked Utah, beat up on them good, and then they turn around and lose to Kentucky. They couldn't do anything offensively. A couple of interceptions, one of them ended up going back for a touchdown. They were inept. As a matter of fact, I think they only got, what, a field goal in the second half? They couldn't score at all. So it just, it just continues to drive the point home for me. We don't need to have rankings come out until after the fourth week is done. I mean after the fourth week is done. Not going into the fourth week, I mean after it's done. And I do believe that the college football playoff should still wait till after week eight before they start doing rankings. And even at that point, there's still a lot of college football left. I would honestly like to see the college football rankings start coming out around week 11 or 12. That's where every team by then just about has played nine or 10 games. You've got a really good idea of who's who based off of who they played. You know, you've got the teams that have gone out and beat up on the little guys, right? So now they're out of that. They've had some in-conference games now. They've had maybe that one semi-competitive or very competitive game outside of the conference against a really good football team from somewhere else, okay? So now we're able to start judging that, and we're able to start judging that based off of what other teams have done with other football teams outside of their conference and how good they're measuring up and how they're going and performing within their conference. And then we get to decide whether or not the conferences are even really that strong to begin with. Because now we're going to be questioning the SEC as a whole. Tennessee, really difficult time with Pitt. Pitt was on a backup quarterback. OU, really difficult time with Texas. And Texas was on a backup quarterback who, granted, had some experience with starting, but had lost that to a freshman. Who, by the way, you would look really good. I mean, it, and it was really a damn shame um, that he couldn't keep going. He, he had that shoulder injury when he got tackled. Uh, I think on that opening drive, he was six out of nine for 64 yards. You know, the the problem for OU and Alabama, or for you know Alabama and Texas, was Texas just couldn't finish drives, man. 
you know, inside the 25 yard line, just couldn't get it done, whatever the reason was. And, you know, give credit to the backup for Texas Hudson Carr. He played as good as he could, especially given the fact that he hurt his ankle. And, you know, Coach Sarkeesian had a huge, I mean, a huge decision make. Do I let Card ride it out or do I stick, you know, my third guy in there? That was going to be a really tough decision to make as well. And uh, whether or not Sark did the right thing, I don't know. What I do know is this. I think if the initial starting quarterback for Texas is in that game, they end up winning. And they don't just win. They win by a blowout. Texas was dialing up some plays. And they were able to throw the ball deep. And the deep ball was usually there. But Card, especially once he hurt his ankle, just could not get the kind of pressure that he needed to in order to be able to release off of his back foot. It, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, plus that crazy call, right? Was it third quarter? It, honestly, when they when they got to Bryce Young in the back of the end zone, that probably should have been an illegal forward pass. And since he did it in the end zone, right, because he's just throwing the ball away, okay, so it's intentional grounding, which is an illegal forward pass, that should have been still a safety. Instead, they overturned the the targeting call, which they initially called roughing the passer with targeting. Then they said that they announced it wrong after they did the the – taken away of the targeting. I mean, and that was a crucial play in that situation. That two points difference and potentially driving down and at least getting a field goal really may have altered the outcome of that football game. And I think it definitely would have changed the approach from Nick Saban and company. Uh, But regardless, give Bryce Young credit. Kid let his team down when he needed to. Uh, Texas's defense was in his face for a good majority of the football game. And and he hung in there. Uh, He's a tough kid. That's for sure. Um, I think he solidified why he was the Heisman Trophy winner from a season ago. Uh, and, and it's obviously going to be in the running again. Uh, Syracuse has got a really good running back in Tucker. I think may have something to say about it. But um, defensively, Texas played as good as you could against Alabama for about 55 minutes in that football game. They just were able to drive down a couple of times late in the fourth quarter and score. You know, that defense was probably tired. It was 90 degrees when the game started, and that was 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, By 2 in the afternoon, who knows how how, how laciously hot it was in that stadium. Um, You know, unfortunately, Texas just couldn't get it done. I think under Sark, it, it looks like we may begin to see steps towards a different Texas football team. But right now, with the injuries and everything else going on, unfortunately, it it may end up being maybe an eight-win season at best for Texas. But uh, maybe going into next season, obviously, and of course, depending on what happens with you or going forward with the shoulder and everything, uh, maybe get a look at maybe what what could be next season. But who knows? But uh, be that as it may, uh, that was pretty much your college football day. Uh, while I was doing this, BYU was was still playing Baylor. They were up 20 to 13 going into the fourth quarter when I started this thing. So obviously I'm going to go in there and check that out here in a little bit and see how that goes. Talk about it probably tomorrow. But uh, regardless, just to kind of recap here, uh, obviously 279, like I said, couldn't have gone any better for Dana White. Uh, overall, really good night of fights, top to bottom, especially the main card. Uh, really ended up turning out exceptional. Uh, Nate Diaz. You and Connor, just stop already. I mean, seriously, the both of you, like, oh, my gosh, it's getting nauseating. Um, As far as Chimeyev goes, look, man, say what you want. The man missed weight for whatever reason, whether it's BS or not. The fact of the matter is, is that he won his fight. He beat Kevin Holland. And um, he didn't leave a lot of question about whether or not Holland could have won that fight. And like I said, I I think he did what he had to do, shutting it down early, risk-reward. I think knowing that if he would have gone any further with that thing, maybe past the second round, it it wouldn't have benefited him at all. He might have lost, but who knows? Uh, That's all speculation. College football, again, just more reasons why we shouldn't have a top 25 poll until week four, maybe even week eight. And the college football playoff voting shouldn't start until about week 12, especially now with them expanding. 
right? With you expanding, to me, you get the chance to be even more selective than you did with four teams. With four teams, you had to be very selective and just kind of basically go, okay, conference champion. Now you get to be even more selective on who's played who, who's playing when, all those good things, who's playing their best ball right now, who was playing their best ball all the way from the beginning to to this time in the season. You know, when did the upsets happen? How did they happen? Were these fluke things? You know, all those great topics of debate and discussion are going to come into play. But you're also going to give the Cincinnati's of the world an even bigger chance. You're going to give the Boise's of the world, the BYU's, who, of course, are moving into the Big 12. uh, BYU, that is. But even then, you're going to give the Boise's of the world a chance. It's going to be well-deserved, you know, because obviously we're seeing Sunbelt teams win, right? We just saw Appalachian State beat Texas A&M. Okay, what did Texas A&M do this season that warranted to, you know warranted their ranking? That's the problem. We're living off of last year, five years ago, ten years ago. Stop it! It's what you're doing this season that should dictate whether or not you are ranked. That's it, and we shouldn't be doing it right out of the gate because, to me, we're doing more harm than good, especially to the players. If I'm being honest with you. What does it benefit the players to start out ranked number five in the country only to end up one loss? I'm sure it's probably going to knock them out of the top 25, if not very close to, right? Now, I understand that you've got to be mentally tough and all that good stuff, but I I think that we forget these are still 18, 19, 20-year-olds, all right? Most of us that watch college football are probably 35 and up, okay? Remember being that age, psychologically, what do things do to you? I don't want to hear about, oh, I did this and that growing up and yada, yada, yada. It's a different situation, man. And you didn't have reporters in your face and you didn't have people talking about you 24-7. You didn't have people in the comment section talking about what you were doing in life, just hitting you over and over again, calling you a bum, calling you a loser, calling you this, calling you that, being derogatory when they speak about you. You didn't put up with those things. These are different. The mental game is different now than it ever has been before. And I don't want to get into the stats of it all, but the point of what I'm saying is I just don't think it does anybody any good. And I think that these committees need to stop pretending that we're not watching because we are. We are definitely watching. You understand? All right, everybody. I am Drew Duncan. This was LST, Late Night Sports Talk. Sing 5-7 Sports. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe, everybody. 